Welcome to the Long-Term Care Chronicles podcast. So good morning, Mary. I just wanted to thank you for coming on to the Long-Term Care Chronicles. And before we actually start, I'll get you to take a moment to tell us about your story as to what happened um, when the lockdown happened last year. Well, today, as we're taping this, today is the day, a year ago today, that I got the call that um, I couldn't go back to see my husband. He is in memory care. He is 67 years old, was diagnosed at the age of 59 with Alzheimer's, and I placed him in a memory care center. uh, This July will be two years ago. So a year ago today, I got the call that said, um, "We're, we're shutting down, you can't come back. Um, I immediately called the executive director and said, this is not going to work for me. I've got to get to him. And she said, let's just wait and see what happens. We've, you know, this is, this is the 15 day to, you know, slow the curve or, um, and so all of us obviously had no idea what we were uh, in for over the next year. But as the days turned into weeks and the weeks turned into months, I started getting very vocal. Um, I started, um, calling the governor's office, emailing the governor, tagging him on all of my social media posts saying, hey, we've got to do something. Um, and it got the attention of not the governor, but the my husband's facility, the corporate office of his facility. Uh, we are in Florida. The corporate office is in North Carolina and completely out of the blue. Um, I had said at the very beginning, what can I do? Can I volunteer? Can I, can I get a job? You tell me what, I'll do whatever I can to get to him. And that's when they kind of said, just hold off. Let's see what happens. His, his company called me out of the blue and said, we have a job if you want it. And I said, I'll take it. And they said, okay. And then I said, what is it? And they said, it's a dishwasher. So I said, all right, dishwashing it is. So I started on July the 3rd. Um, and went in and did my shift of the lunch and dinner dishes. And then I got to go in and see him after 114 days. So that story went viral. I did have a reporter in Jacksonville who started covering the story. And once I became the dishwasher, the story went viral as in like really truly viral. And um, it did get the governor's attention. And he did, he pointed me to a task force that he established the long-term care a reopening task force. So I was able to sit with a panel of professionals of the head, the, the Surgeon General of the state of Florida, the head of the Agency for Healthcare Administration, the head of the Florida Long-Term Care Association. I mean, some the big guys uh, let me sit at the table and I was, I was able to express the, the views of a wife and of a caregiver saying, I have to be able to touch my husband. And my argument was very simple. If I can touch him as a dishwasher, why can't I touch him as his wife? Exactly. And that was a deal breaker to me. The Surgeon General and I had a few words with each other where he was saying, I just can't, I can't go along with that. I can't go along with the hugs that you can, we'll let you in and do six feet. And I'm like, that's not good enough. I need to give him a hug. He needs to feel my touch. I need to rub his back. I need to hold his hand. And So at one point, I mean, I literally slam my hands down on my desk and say, this is a deal breaker. This is a deal breaker for me. I have to do this. This has to be part of it. And he agreed reluctantly. He said, okay, I'm going to agree, but I'm going to put an asterisk by it and Mm -hmm. say, let's be careful. But they let me in. And on on, uh, September the 1st, the governor signed an order that let everybody in the state of Florida as an essential caregiver go into the facilities and touch and hug their loved ones. Wow, that's that's just such an amazing story, but it's just unfortunate you had to go through such a battle for that. And can you just tell our listeners about Caregivers for Com- Compromise and why it was formed? In the middle of all this, in the middle of the story going viral, I started hearing from a lot of people mm-hmm. saying, we're in the same boat, we can't get in. What do we do? How do we fight this? And so I decided to start the Facebook group, uh, Caregivers for Compromise, because isolation kills too. It only took a day or two of that being live for me to realize, okay, every state's different. What what is being allowed in Florida is not being allowed anywhere else. And so we started a Facebook group for every single state. 
So there is a chapter for each state and we have had amazing leaders to step up and, yeah. and take over their own state. And the pages serve at two purposes. One is to be a place where we can all share our stories. We all know the hurt and the frustration and the anger and the hopelessness and the helplessness in this scenario. And we need to be able to share with like individuals, not yes. people who say, well, take him out. I mean, yes. if you don't like it, take him out. So many times, that's absolutely not an option. We, we, that's why they're there is because we couldn't provide them the care that they needed. So we want to be around people who understand our situation and understand our emotion. So number one is support. But yes. number two, and maybe more importantly, is advocacy. What can you do in your state to, for change? Because my goal is to really empower everyone to boldly advocate for your loved one, to really work hard at advocating. Because when this is said and done, and it will be for all of us in, in one way or another, we're going to get back in, but all of our loved ones are going to die at, at, at some point. We need to be able to look back with no regrets that we fought and we did everything in our power to be with them and to take care of them. And the Facebook page truly helps people do that. Yes, and that's that's a great form to, to really use and leverage. And then with your group, what are the main objectives that they're looking for to accomplish? I know that you have the essential caregiver designation and the rapid COVID-19 testing. Why are these are important? The, the testing was important initially. We thought that was going to be, I, I thought that was going to be our end game. I thought we were all going to be tested. And in fact, the leader of the Florida Emergency Services Division who was fighting so hard over the summer to get these tests actually said to me, this is our end game. Everybody can just be tested before they walk in the door. We'll know whether people are positive or negative and whether they can come in and be in the facility, but it didn't work that way. So a lot of places, although they were furnished rapid tests, we start saying, well, maybe the rapid tests aren't effective in determining asymptomatic carriers, you know, and so my facility, for example, never used one of the rapid tests on any visitor ever. So they concentrated on hand hygiene, uh, PPE. And if you do those things, you're gonna be safe. And we were, they were right. So the testing was a bit disappointing. I, I really truly thought that was the light at the end of the tunnel. But at this point, it's, it's proven that we needed the vaccine and the vaccine was the direction obviously that has really made this tide turn at this point. So we, we were, we were fortunate in the state of Florida that um, our numbers, although high, we have stayed open and our governor has been um, um, very open to different ideas of still trying to live life. And certainly in our case, the importance of family. He got choked up. We did a, um, a news conference and he literally, I mean, I was sitting right next to him and I felt like it was five minutes, you know, it was probably a minute and a half where he couldn't speak. He was so choked up saying, you know, the thought that my actions as governor may have contributed to anyone's yeah. heartache or anyone's loss is almost more than I can bear, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and so having that heart um, has been important. And we've been able to lead the way with the essential caregiver designation, for example, to show people it can be done safely. It can be done slowly with, with vision of saying, here are the rules, here's how we're gonna work it. Let's take it step by step and let's be sure that we keep them safe. We know why this was done. We know yes. the good intentions that were meant by it, but, the, but their plan didn't work because it wasn't the family members who were bringing it in. It was the staff who was bringing it in. We have no recorded, I have no knowledge of any facility in the state of Florida, and there are over 4,500 of them where a family member has brought in the virus. We have been real, and that was a concern. In the back yes. of my mind, I am thinking, oh, please, God, please don't let this go bad. Please yes. don't let us be responsible for hurting someone. And we've been incredibly fortunate that we have it. Yeah, no, that's that's very important. And as well, your group is is a support place for 
for members to share their stories? And why is this important for your group to establish this as one of the uh, boundaries or objectives? We have been, I, I, I have realized through this last year, for, for me personally, and I think I can say that I represent so many caregivers, there, this has been grief. We've experienced grief, a complicated grief, because it isn't as if Steve has died, but it was as if Steve was gone, I couldn't get to him. I couldn't care for him. I couldn't talk to him. He is, he is because of the cognitive decline. Somebody asked me the other day, how does he feel about getting the vaccine? I said, he doesn't even know there's a virus. Wow. So he's blissfully happy. He yeah. is perfectly fine and content with his life. He, I mean, it's, it's, it's such a blessing yes. that he is so happy. But for me, you know, not being with him. Um, so we were not able to communicate via FaceTime. I did two window visits with him and he cried both times. And I decided on Father's Day, I, I can't do this anymore. This is too cruel mm -hmm. to him because he doesn't understand. Why are you outside? Why? He's not able yeah. to verbalize that. And he doesn't, he doesn't speak. I mean, every once in a while, you know, he will say, but, but you know, something. And a lot of it is just, um, he, he tells me that he loves me. He puts his hand on my face and rubs my face. He said um, one of the first thing, the first window visit, you know, they have the window crack this much, you know, and it's so ridiculous. And I put my face down in the window and he puts his face right up on the neck, on the window, right, right up close to me. And he says, you're beautiful. And I'm like, oh my God, I've got to get to you. You know, I've got to get to you. So the, that mode, that was just so motivating, not being able to be with him and hug him. So the, the group is a place where we that are experiencing that grief, yes. that heartache, the pain and the anger, yes. mad at the facilities who aren't following the rules, who are demanding that we do certain things. I've seen so many people, I mean, we've been so fortunate in my facility, I've had to wear a mask, that's it. Yes. And you see all these people in double mask and shields and gloves and gowns and the family member is the same. And I get the point, I understand yes. the point, but you know what, you guys, we can't save them from everything. Yeah. There are worse things than dying from COVID. And so the group is a place where we can all go and cry and, and yell and all of those things that a support group is supposed to do. Yeah. We can express that to each other. I mean, my number one, I have two rules on the Facebook groups. Number one is be kind. Yes. We need kindness in the world today. We all need to be kind to each other, no matter what. And the second for our group is no politics. This is not about politics. This is not about politics. This is about human caring, human suffering, love, nurturing. Um, it's about the people that want to be with each other because they love each other. We forget one of our, our traveling signs that we're doing right now all have names of loved ones on them that either died in long-term care or currently are in isolation in long-term care. And you forget that these, who these people are, these are yes. people that live wonderful, full lives that have extended families who adore them. And, and we forget about that because the doors are shut and we can't see their faces at the yes. moment. But for those of us that are their caregivers, we know that hurt and the pain and the frustration and the hopelessness, will this ever end? You know, the thought of all of the people who have died alone, yeah. that, it, that some, some caregivers will never get over. Exactly. They'll never yeah. ever get over that hurt. I've heard it described as a hole in my heart that will never heal because I wasn't allowed to be with my mother when yeah. she took her last breath. I mean, those are things that are very, very difficult to ever recover from. And we can help each other because so many of us are experiencing the same emotions. I'm so glad for your group because that is definitely a big stress uh, to kind of, you know, to even attempt to try to uh, recover from. So I know that your group as well stresses that isolation kills as well as not only COVID-19. Why is this such a, an important highlight uh, for your group to, to, to stress? What have your members seen during these lockdown measures from COVID-19 to further, uh, further indicate that isolation kills? 
we we're seeing the um, diagnosis of yeah. failure to thrive on death certificates. I mean, they say if you if you literally Google failure to thrive deaths during COVID, yes. there is article after article after article on um, the number of skyrocketing deaths due to that diagnosis. That is a diagnosis that is um, describes isolation where you have people that are literally giving up on life because they have no hope of life as they've always known it. And so we see that the decline, the before and after pictures that you can see on our Facebook group. This is my mother in February of 2020. This is my mother today through a window. Um, And we hear their stories. They are saying the ones that are certainly cognitively able to express say, what have I done? They feel as if they're being punished because they don't understand. I would rather die from COVID, they say, than continue in this isolation. I mean, that is something the human, our human spirit and our human nature was not made to endure isolation. I tell the story and I told it to the governor, um, you know, you know how it is in long-term care facilities. We all take care of each other. Mm-hmm. The other families take care of my husband when they yes. were there. And I take care of other people's family if I see them. And when I was there as a dishwasher one night after my shift and I was leaving and there was uh, Kathy was out in the common area and I saw her getting ready to go into someone else's room and I stopped her and I said, come on, Kathy. She was going into auntie's room. And I said, come on, Kathy, let's get back to your room. And I, and I started walking her and she turned and looked at me. Kathy has since passed away. And she, but she turned and looked at me and she said, will you give me a hug? And I almost didn't do it. I actually mm-hmm. kind of looked around. I mean, I had a mask on. Yes. There was nobody else around. And I almost thought... I can't do that. I'm going to, I would get in trouble if somebody Mm -hmm. saw me hug her. So, but I did, I hugged her anyway. And um, it was the best hug that I've ever given anyone. And I told, I told the governor, it's a human instinct for us. This was a woman with Alzheimer's who could barely speak 75 pounds, had not been able to see her husband in months But she said to me, will you give me a hug? And it is just an an innate feeling. We need to be hugged as human beings. We need touch. We need to hold hands. We need our back rubbed. Those are just human qualities and human interactions that we were made to have. And so the isolation and the separation from that is killing people. We know that COVID kills but isolation kills too. Absolutely, absolutely. So back in September 1st of 2020, the executive order 2052 in the state of Florida came from the task force that was created by Governor DeSantos, in which you, Mary, representing the group was a member of that task force. How important was it that your group was acknowledged for providing a voice for families on the task force? I I think without me being on that task force, we would have never been able to hug. As I was saying earlier with the, with the surgeon general, who was like, no, no, we're not going to allow that. And I kept saying, why can I touch him as a dishwasher? And and, and you've heard, you've heard caregivers say that over and over again, right? Of the staff comes in and out. Why can't I do what the staff does? Why can't I wear PPE like the staff does? That doesn't make any sense. And it, and it, it doesn't make any sense. I go in there and I wash dishes and I'm able to go in his room and hug him. And that was one of the, the th- first things I asked him. I said, when they, when we talked about the dish, I mean, doing the job, can I touch him? Yes. And they said, yes, you can touch him. So if I can touch him as a dishwasher, why in the world can't wives and husbands and sons and daughters touch them as their family member. And if without me sitting there, there's no doubt in my mind about it. Without me sitting there fighting for that, it it just wouldn't have happened for us in September. No way. Exactly. And then would you be able to speak just to the three main objectives of the task force to integrate families back into the long-term care? The number one, and I certainly agree, the number one, because we're talking in August, this is August, We still didn't understand this virus. I mean, do we even now? But you know what? I mean, it was so early on when you look back on it that 
the, the number one task force, and it said it in the name, the safe reopening. Nobody wants anybody hurt. And I mentioned that earlier as well. Yep. Truly awake at night thinking, boy, I hope this is okay. You know, a boy, I hope that me sitting on this task force and saying we have to have this isn't a mistake, isn't going to cost us lives. Safe reopening, step-by-step reopening. So that was really number one. Um, Number two, I will tell you a big part of it, and I've learned a lot uh, about politics as much Mm -hmm. as we're, that's not my group, but these large associations, the Florida Long-Term Care Association, the Florida Assisted Living Association, even the Alzheimer's Association, this is politics. These are lobbying agencies that are talking to our governor and the head of ACA and the head of the elder affairs division in a way that benefits their world. So we did have to think about the business of long-term care. And I do recognize that it's a business. I do recognize that companies do this. And I'm a huge believer in companies doing this to make money. That's perfectly fine with me, but it was interesting to see how that also can play in terms of them protecting their own interest. I understand it. I, that's why you have a, a Florida Healthcare Association or Assisted Living Association. I understand it, but from the consumer side of it, seeing that it may be hurting my loved one because you want immunity yes. for your facilities, is, is an interesting dynamic that you don't get to see. So there was that in play, protecting the facilities and helping the facilities was certainly a part of that. So it was a balance of saying, how do we balance getting what we want, which is getting back in. And I think we'll see through time that this has been a very interesting dynamic in terms of the power struggles between the facilities and the residents and the residents' families, the caregivers, there is a power play that has become a part of this. No question about it. And there's also part of it that as much as we believe we help and we do, and as much as responsible facilities say, we want our caregivers back in, our place is better, our facility is better with caregivers in the building versus without. Um, This has drawn attention to those facilities, and they are out there, that don't want us in, that don't want us to see what's happening. Um, And maybe that's staff shortage. Maybe that this is staff being underpaid and overworked and family members being neglected. I mean, there's a, I think this has really opened up a can of worms in terms of what are we going to do next down the road? Once we get back in, how do we make things different? How do we do it different next time? And how do we help this industry? And how do we help the people that work in this industry be better? And I think you'll see us all transition. Those of us that are sort of leading this cause, you'll see us transition into that. Definitely. And um, just to follow up, you know, can you just define how you determine in terms of the essential caregiver and the compassionate care visitor? The essential caregiver was decided, and and this is again, one of the things that we discussed and I got to play a role in because they were saying initially only someone that had been in the facility before and had to do help with activities of daily living. And I argued that there are people that may not, my husband's children, for example, they're all grown, but they don't live in Jacksonville. They wanna come and see him as well. And they need to be allowed in, even though they didn't see him two days a week for the year prior to. Um, And so how do we define that essential caregiver? Because I am there to help with his activities of daily living. I get him ready for bed every night. We change his clothes. I get him tucked in. I get be sure he's brushed his teeth. All of those things I do because I want to do it. But I don't want that to be a requirement of me being there. The key requirement, and they finally agreed to it, was for the essential caregiver is emotional support. 
As long as you give emotional support, you are considered to be an essential caregiver and you are allowed in. So we started with the essential caregiver. And then in October, well, in September, CMS came out with compassionate caregiver. And we meshed with that in the state of Florida in October. So okay. it became a compassionate caregiver. Now, many people are confused about that because they believe compassionate caregiver defines end of life, specifically yes. end of life. And it doesn't. A compa and, and it certainly under CMS and under the Florida guidelines as they stand right now, compassionate caregiver, compassionate caregiver is basically the same as an essential caregiver. All you have to do is provide emotional support at okay. any time in the life of the resident. They don't okay. have to be dying, actively dying for you to be allowed in, which is as it should be. Yes, yes, definitely. So that's that's good to know that those definitions, um, you know, especially the compassionate caregiver doesn't mean end of life, Correct. so to speak. That's great. So in the state of Florida, back in September of 2020, the executive order 2052 came out. Did your group notice immediate change? And what has happened since then? Is that still been received? It's still open that people can be able to visit under those two different definitions? It did not um, happen immediately, and I was okay. extremely disappointed. September the 1st, the order was signed. It was, I believe, a Thursday. Yeah. I called my facility. We're open. No, nope, no. Nope. They say, we're going to, we need a few days. Maybe okay. in the next week or two, we're going to open in the next week or two. And I'm, and I'm saying, no, 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 no. No way. I mean, you guys knew this was coming. We knew what was happening. And so I started putting pressure on my facility and realizing that other facilities were not, were doing the same. We're not letting people in right away. So we, I started for the Facebook group, started doing some videos. Okay. Educate yourself, educate yourself so that you can educate the facility, print out the order, read the order, highlight the order in the places where your facility is not meeting the guidelines as they're written and hand them to the facility and say, this is what the order says please let me in. Please don't make me report you to ACA. Please don't make me do that. This is what the order says. Clear as day, I need to be let in. And most places did. Now the exception came in late, in, in mid-September, CMS came out with guidelines that were different. So nursing homes and rehab facilities pulled back on the visitation. And still, I mean, until now, we have we have many nursing facilities, skilled nursing facilities in Florida that have not allowed visitation because they say they fall under the CMS guidelines, not the state guidelines, because they get their money from the federal government. So it's been, it, and I've been continuing to fight with the governor's office of saying we need to be clear. They did issue a new order in late October that meshed more with the CMS order but it says that we can take our loved ones out of the facility as long as they're, they're questioned with screening questions when they return, they do not have to be quarantined. But that order is not being enforced. ACA is not enforcing that order. So at Thanksgiving, it was a really big deal. My facility told me if you take Steve home mm -hmm. for Thanksgiving meal and bring him back, he will have to be quarantined for 14 days in his room. And if he can't stay in his room by himself, because he doesn't know to stay in his room, exactly. you, know that, you have to hire a private sitter to stay in his room with him 24 hours a day for 14 days. So who does that? I mean, I, yeah. so I can't take him out. So the order says I can take him out but my facility says I can't. And every facility made their own rules, has made absolutely their own rules and it's not being enforced. And I said to the governor's office and to ACA, if you're not gonna enforce the order, rescind the order, rescind yes. it. Don't put something out there because I can't take the paper to my facility. In fact, I said to them, I'm gonna call ACA. And they said, we already called them and they said they're not gonna, that they're, they won't do anything if we wanna do a quarantine. Wow. So the power of the caregiver is gone. It was really frustrating that we had an order that said one thing, but we, 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 couldn't, we couldn't follow that order. My personal opinion is that the governor put it out there and he didn't want to retract it. If he rescinds mm. it, 
he's taking a step backwards, yeah. isn't he? He's yeah. not being that progressive governor that we're seeing of open, open, open if he pulls it back. So I think for the holidays, they laid low. I couldn't get them to respond to me. I couldn't get mm -hmm. them to talk to me. They just sort of ignored it and told Aka, do what you want to do. I'm, we're not going to worry about it right now. Yeah. So the new CMS order that has just come out says, after following the CDC, saying that you can be around. I've been vaccinated. Yeah. My husband's been vaccinated. Why can't I take him for a drive? Like we used to do every Sunday, we would go out and sit by the river and watch the boats and I'd get him a blizzard from Dairy Queen, his favorite mm -hmm. thing in the world. And just to get him out of there, he's yes. left the facility one time in the last year. And that was for a root canal. Wow. So, I mean, he needs to get out and get sun on his face and, you know, and be yeah. with my, my sister and her husband have both been vaccinated. They're our best friends. Why can't we go sit outside and on their back porch on a yes. Sunday afternoon? So we are going to be able to do that. And my facility has acknowledged that they are going to let us do that. I think we'll probably starting on Monday um, that they'll let us take them out. They're going to ask them some screening questions when they get back, but he will pass those screening questions and I can now take him out of the facility. So we are finally at the point where that previous order is getting um, enforced. I had a, uh, the governor was in Jacksonville yesterday and did a press conference. And one of the reporters asked him, will you be issuing a new order in mm -hmm. response to CMS? And he said, we will, if we need to, we don't think that we're going to need to, we think it's pretty clear what the order says, but if we find that there's facilities that aren't enforcing that or aren't honoring it, then we may get involved. So we're keeping an eye out to see how it's going to go. Um, our facility is going to honor it. Are they going to let us everybody back in, including skilled nursing facilities? Um, okay. And are they going to let us take them out if they're physically able to do that? We'll see in the coming weeks how that's going to work. And then our, our fight continues as needed um, yes. until everybody gets back in. You know, that, that's, that's definitely great because I'm sure there's still, as you mentioned before, there are still facilities that have locked out family caregivers from coming in. And how... How is your group supporting not only just your members, but let's say if there's non-members reaching out to your group, how, do, how does uh, your group go about supporting those individuals? It's really important that we have a couple different websites. We have our Caregivers for Compromise website. We also have a isolationkills.org for yes. this week um, that details all of our activities all over the United States so that people can get involved. One of the ways to, go, to get over the helplessness feeling Yes. The hopelessness feeling is action, taking action. So this week we've had, really for building up to this in the last month, we've had a lot of email writing campaigns. We've had letter writing campaigns. We sent to um, CMS in bright yellow envelopes, um, thousands of letters, um, social media campaigns, the traveling signs, get active, get out and do something. If you're not wanting to do something, and I tell people this all the time, you know, I, I, you action will help you feel better and feel less hopeless because you're actually doing something to help. So yes. you have a choice. People, and, and some people say, "Oh, I can't do that. I don't. I don't know how to do that. I can't do that." And and I say, "Listen, you don't have to do that. It, it, you can choose not to participate in any of the things we do. That's perfectly fine. But stop complaining about the situation then." Yes. Because if you're not willing to help us, then don't get on here and complain that you're not, your facility is not doing something. We're all here to solve the problem. And when all of this is over, the ones that have been active and contributed to us succeeding are the ones who are going to have the peace of mind for the rest of their lives, knowing that they did that. No regrets right? No, no grief over how horrible this was. Yes, it's horrible. Yes, it, it's unacceptable. Yes, we don't ever want it to happen again. But I did something. I fought for them. I was there for them. I never gave up on them. And even if you even if they ended up dying, we have family members that are still fighting because they lost a loved one and they're not gonna let them die in vain. They're gonna That's fight right. to keep this from happening again. That goes to your spirit and that will feed you 
forever. And it may change your life in terms of how you live the rest of your life. Exactly. Being that empowerment really can feed you to feel confidence that you can change the world. That one person, I tell people, I'm, I'm not special. I haven't done anything special. I've just fought for my husband and, mm -hmm. you know, thought, hmm, I wonder if we need to do a Facebook group. Okay. I'm going to start a Facebook group. That's not special. I just decided that's what I was going to do. And so, and we've been able to bring all these people with us. Everybody can do that. Every single person out there can do that. It's just a choice and it's perfectly fine. You don't have to, mm -hmm. but we're going to be the ones standing there hugging each other and cheering each other on because, oh my gosh, yeah. it worked. We got to CMS. CMS heard us. They felt the pressure from us. I'm absolutely confident of that. Um, uh, Evan Schulman was supposed to do a webinar with us on Monday and canceled right at the last minute because he was working on urgent things. And we were very upset about it. Um, yes. But he came, comes out um, on Wednesday with these new guidelines, which is exactly what we wanted. Right. So he yes. knew we were there. He knew that the that as advocates, as family caregivers, that we are getting restless that and we give very specific things of what we want. I mean, very specific in Florida. We wanted the current order enforced, the one that says I can take him out. Yes. Then we wanted a new order for the vaccines. What about the vaccines? We've said one shot, two years. Now what? We want to know what you're thinking. What is the plan now that everybody's vaccinated? And the third thing on our on our paper was we want a plan for legislation so this never happens again. That essential caregivers will never be separated from their loved ones again. We want law. We want laws yeah. written in every state so that's never a problem again. So we have very specific things that they all know, our legislators, our governors, CMS, they all know what our goals are. Yes. That's advocacy work at its boldest, at its finest, where you're actually truly making a difference. That's fantastic. And I'm just going to go back again to the task force and the framework that was provided for two families uh, and long term care facilities. And then if we can just, you know, go and break down each step as there is a clear understanding that they this may be similar or uh, or different uh, to some of our listeners in other jurisdictions and can be implemented across the United States. So for the first one, the requirements, what were the requirements that were put forth by the task force? The requirements for us to get back in? Yes. Um, yes. The, the task force really concentrated on setting up a structure in the facility. So they wanted everybody to put together their plan, every facility to put together their plan of how are they going to handle the visitors. So it, it differed. And that's one of the things that was part of the yeah. delay because it was different for every facility. You have facilities that have 10 residents or you have you know facilities that have 300 residents. Mm -hmm. So how are they going to manage the visitors? Because part of it was only having a certain percentage of visitors in the building at one time. So it was important that we put those guidelines as part of it. Here's what we want that structure to look like. So it was that that was a part of it. The basis for these facilities was a really important part of, of what we were doing. And then it became the requirements for the caregivers. What is required of you? So in my facility, we had to take a, a video class of proper PPE, um, disposal of PPE, how to put it on. Um, that sort of thing. So there was a bit of an education component. It's about a 30 minute class that you had to take to okay. do that. So um, that was part of it, educating us on what we needed to do in the, in, the, in the process that we needed to follow so that we were sure that we weren't going to be part of the problem, that we weren't going to be the problem of bringing this into the facility, right? That was a big part of it. Yes. So really educating everybody on that that process was a big part of the requirements or the protocols that we put into place for people to, to take out of it. And on the task force were people within the industry. So that worked out very well that they could then go to the, you know, as the Florida Assisted Living Association could yes. go to their members and then educate their members as well. You know, so it wasn't just them getting this directive from the governor's office. It was actually their association leaders saying, this is what we agreed to. 
So this is what everybody must comply with. And so mm-hmm. that, that helped a lot in compliance because you have their own, you know, association leadership telling you this is the way that we needed to do it. So that was the really the basis of the work that we were doing. It comes to now where, I mean, we don't meet as a task force anymore. Now we had always said we might reconvene and I have asked for it from time to time, like for example, when they weren't enforcing the last order where we could remove um, the Steve from the facility. But I'm, I'm hopeful that we've come so far now with the new CMS that states won't need to do that. But where, where, where it comes into play and where I think the, government, the governors and the state governments can help is educating facilities on the difference between the state guidelines and the federal guidelines. Assisted living says we go by state, nursing facilities say we go by federal. Those all yeah. need to mesh to make this easier so that we're not dealing with those little nuances that one facility is doing it this way and another facility is doing it that way simply because their dollars come from different funding sources. Um, And so that's what we constant, what we're concentrating on now is focusing in on the state governors, the state governments, whatever that is, it may be the department of health. That's part of the confusion in my state, ACA, the agency for healthcare administration administers everything in Mm -hmm. other states it's the department of health or they're called whatever they happen to be in your own state so that's where the state groups come in is to educate everybody to say okay our focus is my i have a mary nichols is in texas she's in Mm -hmm. charge of the texas group amazing amazing Mm -hmm. she knows texas she's just been um testifying this week in front of the texas house and senate amazing woman, amazing advocate. Today, she is flying a banner yes. behind a plane over the Capitol today. Yes. I mean, amazing stuff, right? But yes. she knows her state in and out. I don't know Texas. I don't need to know Texas. I need to know Florida. So that's what we want everybody in their particular states to focus on their group page okay. and get involved on that group page. So when somebody says, write the governor or write your state representative or write the, 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 you know, the head of the Department of Health, that's what you need to do as a concerted effort so that you can organize in your own particular state. Yeah, absolutely. But I just want to, you know, to say, because some of the framework that you've, you've indicated can be transferred in terms of being able, right? So I know that you mentioned in terms of the outdoor visitation policy, what did that look like for what you guys had um, decided on? Well, we, I'm not a big fan of outdoor visitation. I'm yeah. a big fan of indoor in his room. I, for, when I got in after 114 days, the light bulbs and his lamps were out his remote control was missing from his television. He didn't have his glasses. I mean, those are things that I need to be in his room to see. Yes. Right. I go in his room every day and, and straighten up and clean and find things, you know, where he's hidden something or, you know, and so we need to be in their rooms. So the outdoor visits for us were in Florida were for general visitation. We did have a general visitation classification. That was less important to me. I didn't really care about that because immediately it just needs to be the essential caregiver. You know, if the grandkids Mm -hmm. don't come in September, I'm okay with that as long as the main caregivers were able to go in and touch them. So the general visit, the general visitors were outdoor visits, social distanced, um, you know, so the grandkids couldn't hug, you know, grandmother but they could be outside with her. That's okay. I mean, I don't want to take that away from anybody, but that's the least important thing. And that's why in the new CMS guidelines, they say everyone, they talk about recommending outdoor visits because you're outside, because you're in open air, but we're talking about the majority of, of, of uh, residents being vaccinated and, I just don't think at this stage that that needs to be a requirement. That's just my own personal experience. Mm -hmm. So I think they feel a need and, and I think um, for it, it becomes a choice for some people, but I, I want to be inside his room. I want to see his, his, his uh, environment. I want to be sure everything is protected and he's, you know, and he's living um, with the enjoyment of the things that he needs. And I can't do that in an outside visit. Yeah, exactly. And then 
just the last two points here, just for when there was or is an active COVID case in the facility, what would have been the process for still continuing the visitations? We were allowed in regardless of COVID status. Perfect. So that person was would be quarantined. Mm -hmm. um, and my facility had actually very low numbers. We had eight cases the entire time. They wow. were quarantined. And, um, and I never would, I never saw, never was around, never. And, you know, me going into his room um, was not in any way affected by the COVID numbers in the building. And I think that's really, really important. And it went very safely. Yes. It was fine. If that person isn't mingling. Now, the difference would be if Steve had been exposed mm -hmm. and they thought Steve had it, or if Steve did have it, I could not visit then yes. because he was, if he was positive and if he was quarantined, only him, if it was anybody else in the building, I was allowed to come into the building. Okay. And then the, the lastly, the complaint process. If someone had a complaint, what would they have to do? They would have to file a report with the Agency for Healthcare Administration, okay. who was very, very active in helping us. That um, They actually allowed me to join them in writing the frequently asked questions. Okay. Um, and so they wrote them, sent twice for both orders in September and in October, sent them to me, let me edit at them to be a lot clearer, not in government speak, but in real language. So I was able to edit them and, and include things, take out things that weren't necessary to make it very, very clear. And this is what we're asking the governor for now, yes. if we need it, very concise, direct language. There's no shalls, there are no mays. Mm -hmm. You must do these things. And if you don't do these things, this is what's going to happen. Yes. And we're going to call ACA. We're going to file a complaint and ACA is going to come knocking on your door to do a visit, to come talk to you. What has happened is they haven't, they were getting so many of them that they were making phone calls and they were talking to the executive director saying, you guys, you got to let them in. Yeah. You can't keep them out. And they, in places were opening up. Now, then you have, you know, the problem that now the places are mad at you because you forced your way in, even though that was exactly what was allowed. Yes. And there are a lot of caregivers out there that are afraid of that. They're afraid of retaliation mm -hmm. on their loved ones. Exactly. And I tell them, I don't know how to, I don't know how to help you with that. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not going to leave my husband in a place where I'm afraid he's going to be punished for me fighting to get to him. Now, I realize that I now, I, you know, I'm, I've been known to cut my nose off to spite my face, that now I've got to find another place and now mm -hmm. I've got to move him. And now I've got to, but sometimes right is right and wrong is wrong. And it may yes. cause me more trouble and it may be disruptive for a while, but I'm not leaving my husband somewhere where I'm afraid someone's going to punish him. I'm just exactly. not. Yeah. And, and we need to stand up to that. And we need to say that's not acceptable. And we need to report when we need to. That's why I say boldly yes. advocate. It's scary sometimes. You don't Very. know if it's the right thing in terms of what's going to happen. But you should know in your gut and in your heart mm -hmm. and in your head what's right and what's wrong. And you have to continue to fight for them to, to, and that's what we're doing is righting wrongs. When, when people are being mistreated or not being allowed what the state says they can allow, I mean, their rights have basically disappeared. Exactly. Yeah. All of their rights are gone. They now are at the, at the, you know, mercy of their government or of their facilities leaders I mean, it's really been a real turn of events when you really step back and look at it. And that's why I said earlier, we'll see once we get in and once things are shifting back a little bit to normal, what this means in terms of changes in the world yeah. of long-term care. There has been for a long time, a need for attention mm -hmm. in the world. And I think one of the silver linings of this is gonna be, it, we're gonna see it now. Yeah. I hope, I really do hope so, because uh, you're right in terms of people's rights have been pretty much violated here. And that's, that's a huge one. I, I know you mentioned earlier that your group has a number of initiatives. 
uh, what are you presently working on to further push the agenda for long-term care issues? And would you let our listeners know what they can do to assist in the state of Florida or any other state? We are right now concentrating, um, we're recording this during the anniversary week. Yes. Um, today is really the anniversary of the lockdown. And so we have events all over the United States today in yes. state capitals um, where we're joining together. One of the benefits have been, even with our traveling signs that are in West Palm Beach today, is meeting each other, that we've known each other, we've met each other on Facebook through the group. But being able to be with each other and hug each other and, and really see the people and get to meet the people that we've been working with over this last year. Um, so we are concentrating this week um, on those events, on uh, calling attention and awareness to the fact that this isolation has still been going on and that we are at the year mark. We are really excited about the new CMS guidelines that have just been released. We believe mm -hmm. that um, obviously, these are game changing for for all of our loved ones. And so our next step, we're going to take a breath at the beginning mm -hmm. of next week. Um, and then we're going to move forward in what's happening in each state in terms of how is your state interpreting those federal guidelines? What do we need to do in Florida? The governor said yesterday that he they are 100 percent behind those guidelines and will implement them statewide. Um, so I may not have to do anything in Florida. I may okay. not need a new order in Florida like I thought that I might. So my next step may be in Florida, and we'll assess this as in, in, in the early, in the next couple of weeks. Um, let's move toward legislation. Our, our, um, our politicians are in session right now. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, talking to them to say, okay, we, what have we learned from this? What are we going to do differently moving forward? And we need to work on that. And so I think that's all, that will be our next step. Everybody, and I realize not everyone is on Facebook, but it has just yes. been a very, very good forum for us as a way to reach people. So find your state group. We do have a national page. We have over 14,000 people on the national page, Caregivers for Compromise. And then you can search Florida Caregivers for Compromise yes. and find your page. You can get as involved as you want to be. You can be someone who just is reading and doing the calls of action that we post, or you can design calls to action if you'd like to. You can put in your feedback and your suggestions of what you think we need to be doing. You can have a real impact in your state today yeah. by joining these groups. So we encourage everybody to do that. Thank you for that. That's really good because we do have a number of listeners in the United States. So with the vaccine rollout in Florida, how has that process been for individuals in long-term care and their families and employees that work in long-term care? What has your members experienced and are learning uh, through this process? It has been, um, it was delayed. It was slower yeah. than we thought, but I will have to tell you that again, our governor was very committed to seniors first. So, um, and I, I, I said to somebody the other day, this is a pretty overwhelming task. Um, so many people are critical of, uh, you know, it's slow, it's hard to get an appointment, there aren't enough places. This is a process. These folks are really learning as they go. Um, we've never done anything like this before. And so I believe that it actually has gone very, very smoothly. Um, delayed, yes, but once it got really going and rolling, um, it really is working very, very well. My facility did not require every their, their staff to get the vaccine. They educated them and want them to make their own decision. And in my facility, 100% of the staff have been vaccinated. Um, and 100% of the residents have been vaccinated. Um, I do believe the industry will turn, and I believe my own company, my husband, this facility, they will begin requiring the vaccine. Okay. I just think it's, it's, just, it's just a requirement in this mm -hmm. world. We can't go back. And one of the things that we talk about in our white papers to our politicians is, it is time to stop punishing residents for what people on the outside are doing or not doing. 
So yes. they're going out in large crowds and they're going to these super spreader events and they're rising the rates in your city. Mm-hmm. And so you can't visit because people outside are not being responsible or not doing following the right precautions. And now we're going to do it the opposite of not only what they're doing that's causing the numbers to rise, but now because if they don't get the vaccine, you're going to punish them. Well, you can't go in to visit because all the all the staff didn't get the vaccine. So the possibility that the virus is still in the, you know, can come into the building. So we're not going to let you in. We need to stop punishing the residents for what the outside world is doing because they have no control over the outside world. So I truly believe that in this industry, you're going to have to get the vaccine. You just are. Yeah. You, it's just not going to be a choice. You And, and it, you don't have to, but mm-hmm. you're going to have to just go work in, in another way. You're going to have to find other work instead of in a long-term care facility because they need to be protected and they need to have the quality of life that comes with everyone getting vaccinated. That's why I got vaccinated. I don't get a flu shot normally, but I needed to get to my husband and I work in the healthcare field as my day job. And I, and I had the opportunity to get vaccinated and I did because I wanted to protect him and his other residents and the other residents. I wanted to feel confident going in. Now I still wear a mask, Mm -hmm. which is no big deal. And, but I, but I absolutely feel confident going in knowing that everybody in there has been vaccinated. Yes. And that brings that peace of mind that's going to bring their lives back to them, their livelihood and the love that they've been missing. So it's worth it to me to, um, and, you know, I think we're seeing numbers, low numbers in some places in terms of, you know, uh, staff. Yes. I, I do think it's a, it's a part of an industry where you have people that are overworked and underpaid who are saying, no, you can't tell me what to do. Mm-hmm. exerting some power where they have it to say, you can't make me do that. And I think that plays a role, sadly. And yeah. I think that's human nature. I, I don't mean that in any blaming way, no, no. but I think it's human nature to say, you're not paying me enough. This has been a horrible year. This has been so hard on everybody. The turnover in the industry is so high that this is a way for them to have some sense of control over their own environment, over their workplace, even if it may be the wrong decision for the workplace, for the betterment of the workplace. So I think addressing that and addressing the issues of an unhappy employee would be maybe go a long way to getting those numbers up higher. Somebody that loves their job and wants to protect their residents I mean, I see it all the time. There are people that are working in this industry that don't need to be in this industry. They need to be doing something else. Yeah. And I've told staff people that you're in the wrong industry after I heard them yell at a, a resident. No, no, no. You're in the wrong business. If that's the way you talk to a resident, that's not acceptable. And those people need to find other work, but the ones that really care, and there certainly are the ones who love their work and yes. who love these residents they want to do what's in the best interest of the resident and they want to take care of them. And I think those folks, when educated about the vaccine and learn about the vaccine, will get the vaccine to protect their loved ones that they care so much about. I couldn't agree with you more. That's well said. Thank you. And I'll just mention, I know you mentioned before, there are some members or some families that, you know, have taken their loved ones out of long-term care during this pandemic. What would have been the, the, the process to have made this better for, for them so they didn't have to resort to taking out their loved one out of long-term care? Um, it, the simple answer is let us in. We should yes. have all been able to get back in. We should have all been able to care for them. Um, it's because so many people have taken that burden um, and I mean burden, not in a, in a, you know, in a negative connotation, but the understand. The, they, they're in a long-term care facility because it was difficult to care for them. I, mean, I put Steve in, in the memory care center because he is a social human being. He loves people. And I had him, I mean, literally locked in the house all day long. He was exit seeking and I had to put deadbolts on the doors so that he would not leave the house. So he was like a caged animal and putting him in this memory care center gave him, I mean, the, the freedom 
to walk around. He, they, he had a chair at the front desk. He had a name tag. He thought he worked there. He greeted everybody that came in, hugged everybody, whether it was a family member or the delivery man or the medical providers. He was thriving in that environment. So for me to take him out and put him back in that cage, basically, is a very difficult decision. Very, very hard and difficult decision. But so many people were faced with complete isolation, complete separation. You know, if I see another one of those stupid shower curtain hugging things, yes. I'm going to scream. You've got to be kidding me. I, that doesn't excite me. That mm. makes me angry. Really? Really? That's what we're going to do? I mean, you, I mean, it just, so, I mean, getting to them and being with them safely, yes. safely, we were, we proved, I proved that we could do that yeah. and took that responsibility very, very seriously. And that's why I say we have to have new legislation so it never, ever happens again. We have to be sure it never happens again, that we learn something from this and we honor our elderly, we honor yes. our loved ones. Um, you know, so many young people in group homes yes. that have been affected by this. Um, we don't want to forget about them. I mean, we need to honor these people, uh, not isolate them. Exactly. And since we're now coming to the end, I just wanted to give you one last uh, chance here to, if there, you have any final thoughts or any words uh, for our listeners. I never dreamed a year ago that we would be here, right? That, that and, and that caregivers for compromise, what in the world is that? And, yeah. and it, it has been incredibly rewarding to see so many people come together and work together. It is possible for us to make change and it is empowering for us to know that our love for our families and for our loved ones is such a priority to us and to so many other people that it yes. brings us honor and joy to fight for them. There is a peace that comes with that. And I'm super honored to be able to lead such a great group of people. Um, and, and I hope that when, as I've said before, when this is all said and done, that everyone is inspired that yes. no matter what happens in their life, you can take an active role and you can change the world. You can really do it. Thank you so much, Mary. Your words are just unbelievable. So thank you so much for sharing your story and taking the time to come on to the Long-Term Care Chronicles. I really do appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you so much.